Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Just pull it down. All right, I'm Bobby Kinnear, and uh, it's welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you all found this lovely place. I hope everybody got a good parking spot. I went over there by the city. I hope they don't take me away, but it's, <clears throat> they will. I have, yeah, it's six o'clock, okay. Uh, it's not six yet, but I'm okay. So anyway, I am a member of the Westmont Foundation Board, and it is the Westmont Foundation Board who sponsors this downtown lecture series, which began, began October 2005. Yeah, 17 years ago, isn't that neat? The series highlights highlight important topics of the day, topics you read in the news and you'd like to know more about. The fa faculty at Westmont discusses very reliable information and they are here to answer your questions. This series is a gift to our community. The goal is for those who attend to enjoy meaningful and fundamental and lively conversations. Please don't be shy. Ask our fine speaker lots of questions. Now, I take great pleasure in introducing to you Dr. Eileen McMahon McQuaid, Associate Dean of the Faculty. Dr. McQuaid joined the Provost's office in June of 2016, but has been a professor in the biology department since 2004. She received her PhD in immunology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago. She was a visiting professor for a one-year appointment at University of California, San Francisco for her last sabbatical, which was 2010 and 11. Since returning, Dr. McQuaid has worked closely with the provost's office, first as department chair, 2011 to 2015, and then as vice chair of the faculty, 2012, 2013. You are a very busy person. Dr. McQuaid will introduce you to our speaker, Timothy, Timothy Van Hatsuma. Hatsuma, did I get it right? Oh, shoot. <laughs> I even practiced. Anyway, thank you, Dr. McQuaid, for introducing Timothy. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Bobby. It's great to meet you. Good evening, everyone. I just want to um, say thank you to the Westmont Foundation. This is, uh, with their generous support, we've had this lecture series, and I just really think it's a wonderful way for Westmont to serve the community, to highlight our faculty, but also to talk about topics that matter. <laughs> and I hope, this is the professor in me, I hope that today or tomorrow, you'll talk to someone and say, hey, guess what I learned last night? Guess, guess what I just heard? And, and then it starts a conversation. So this is just a real gift. So thank you, Bobby, and all the work that the Westmont Foundation does. Uh, well, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Tim, uh, Dr. Tim Van Heitzma today. Dr. Van Heitzma graduated from Calvin College, earned a master's degree. Um, am I going in and out, or I'm, am I good? Okay, <laughs> I'm just hearing it. And a doctorate at the University of Utah. He joined the faculty in 2014 after teaching for a year at Georgetown College. His expertise includes human physiology, exercise physiology, human performance, and clinical exercise physiology, and he is widely published in the peer-reviewed journals in these areas. But in addition to all that scholarly work, which he's very prolific in, he also serves as a consultant for companies like shoe companies <laughs> that hire Tim to do some evaluation of prototypes that they have and how that affects human performance. You know, Tim is someone that I, you know, look at his CV and I think, he could go anywhere. I mean, he probably can make a lot more money at a big company. But you know what else you need to know about Tim? He loves students and has a great love of teaching and loves, again, engaging in those conversations with students uh, about things that really matter. And, and there's just always an excitement that uh, surrounds Tim as he's in the classroom and working with students in the lab. Um, I have known him for about seven years as a colleague and a neighbor. I will say that he uh, definitely is somebody who pra practices what he preaches, um, especially as it comes to exercise and being active and all the health benefits that come from that. He, I think, 
it is fair to say that the outdoors is his happy place, <laughs> and he loves to run and backpack and hike. Um, and I will also say his family is also very active, and he has two young daughters. Now, his sport is not cycling, but I can say his two daughters, the oldest of which is in kindergarten, they cycle better than me. <laughs> so there's, there's something amazing going on in, in that family, but it's really uh, great to see. Uh, Tim's research interests focus on exercise-induced fatigue, both intermediate and long-term chronic fatigue syndrome, and how the mind affects human performance. And it's that, that last area that he's going to share with us today. So thank you. Tim, we're excited to hear your talk. Thank you, Eileen. Um, I look forward to talking about this for the next little bit. So let's actually start. I am Tim Van Heitzma. I've been at Westmont for now, starting in my ninth year. And my research right now is really focused on how mental training improves endurance performance. How does that actually happen? So I'm going to demonstrate a little bit of why this matters. And I'm going to talk through a couple of studies that I've done at Westma with some of my undergrads. And then I'm going to give you some takeaway tips for how to improve your mental performance. So let's go ahead and get started. So why study mental training? What brought me to this? And part of it goes back to when I was a high schooler or in college and I was running cross country and track. And I looked around and I saw the people next to me and it's like, man, these guys are good. These guys are fast. They have all of these physical skills. Yet when it got to race day, I would sometimes beat people that should have been way faster than me. Behind me here, he was at one point. And yet I was ahead of him. I beat him in this race. I was never anywhere close to being All-American. Or we can go to more recent when I ran nine trails here in Santa Barbara. I was definitely undertrained, and yet I, was, I managed to push through and finish. So during this time, I was able to look at and understand this mental training component and use it, but at the same time, I never really understood it. And as I left to grad school, I moved away from this concept of performance and moved more to health, studying things like asthma, chronic fatigue, and trying to understand what caused fatigue. But when I got to Westmont, I got here and I was starting to study something called a time trial to exhaustion. I was no longer doing chronic fatigue. I didn't have the lab set up for it. So I, I was trying to find my new area. And I started by trying to test this thing called a time trial to exhaustion, which I set a constant load on a bike or a constant, constant speed on a treadmill. And I would have somebody cycle or run until they could no longer go. I just wanted to see, was it repeatable? And on one of these trials, I had a subject, I'll call her Beth, and she was riding on the bike, and she was riding about four minutes in, and I asked a question called rating of perceived exertion. How hard do you feel like you're working? If you're at a six, you're not really working. Where I like to see people is usually in the 16 range. She was at 20. When I see people at 20, at the maximal exertion, I know that usually they have about 30 seconds left. Throughout all of the tests I've done, when somebody hits 20, I know that they've got 30, maybe 60 seconds left. It was at that point that my, my undergraduate research assistant, I'll call him Kyle, said something to her. He said, if you go for four more minutes, I'll buy you a blenders. And I thought to myself, uh-oh, he shouldn't have done that. But then she kept cycling, and she kept cycling. Eight minutes later, when normally one minute, she finally ended. What happened? What is going on? And I remember this thing about mental training. So I had to shift my focus. I got really curious about what is it about the mind that can unlock the body? So I started thinking about what drives performance, and I'm going to start with a simple kind of concept of what performance is. We have the brain in the middle. The brain sends a signal down to the muscle to make it contract. 
The harder you want to exercise, the more signals, the larger the signals it sends. The muscle sends a signal back to the brain, letting it know how hard it's working. And the brain will then modify the signal back to the muscle to understand how hard it's working. At the same time, that signal from the legs, the signal from the brain, gives the brain an idea of how hard it's working. We get this concept of perceived exertion. The brain goes, I'm working at an 18 out of 20 from all of the signals, and that modifies how long we can go. We can actually mod we can measure the signal from the brain to the muscles. That measurement is called electromyography, or EMG. I'm just going to simplify it. We're going to call it EMG. And what EMG is, is it's a little sensor that sits on the muscle. This sensor picks up the electrical signal underneath the sensor. So the brain sends an electrical signal down to the muscle through the nerve, to the muscle, and there's electricity there as well, and that sensor picks up the nerve and the muscle, and I can measure how big of a signal that is. The bigger the signal from the brain, the harder you contract your muscle, the faster you try to run, I actually pick up a larger signal with my EMG. This will be important later on. No, there's not a quiz. So is performance really as simple as I showed? No. There's a whole lot more that goes into performance. So in the early, mid-2000s, uh, there's a guy named Tim Noakes that came out with this theory called the central governor theory. And he tried to answer what drives performance, what goes into performance. The simple thing is still here. We have brain, signal to the muscle, feedback to the brain. But there's a whole lot more going into it. So we have things up here at the top, things that modify the brain. Somehow these change what's happening here. How? Great question. If you can find the research, let me know. I haven't been able to find it. And we get the feedback back, which modifies how hard we're feeling like we're actually going. And we actually learn over time. So as you do an activity, we're able to go, OK, I can actually do this amount. And we learn how much feedback we can handle, and we can change our pace for the next time. And way down in this bottom corner, we can see skeletal muscle fatigue. There's one thing that's really interesting with fatigue. And while I was at Utah, I saw this. Every single time we exercise, if we do a time trial to exhaustion, if we measure the fatigue in your muscle, you will end at the exact same amount of fatigue. So we see about a 35% reduction in how much force your leg can generate give or take a little bit. There's a little bit of inter-individual variability, but you will always end at about the same point. So about 35%. So that seems to be a fairly fixed endpoint. And this will matter again in just a moment. I'll come back to that. So bear with me. But we also see these central, um, centrally acting performance modifiers. So if we're reaching the same point of fatigue each time, what's happening when I modify my mental fatigue, or I change my emotional state. We've all exercised when we're happy, or we've all exercised when we're sad and we don't do as well, or we've exercised when we're angry and we have a really good performance. There's something about emotional states that modify performance. There's also something about our motivation or how much we believe we can do. If I told you that you can do something, as long as it's within what you should be able to do, at least close, you're going to be able to do that. Coaches give belief, and that affects performance. There's something between what you believe and how it affects your brain. And then placebos work. And what I see is really interesting in this graph. I, don't know, I know it's going to be hard to see, but placebos and psychological skills training are in the same box. So according to this, psychological skills training, mental training, is a placebo? That makes me question things a little bit. So I've got some questions about how this works. So really where my research is, is it's understanding this. What does this psychological skills training 
do? How does it change performance? So I had to actually dig into the research just a little bit. And the first thing I saw is that, yes, mental training does improve performance. I'll give you a few examples. Four one-hour sessions of mental training produced an 8% improvement in a 90-minute run. So as a 90-minute run in the heat, people ran 8% farther after four one-hour sessions. If people did goal setting or taught, were taught how to do goal setting, they had a 12% improvement in cycling. That's pretty large. If people were taught how to use motivational self-talk, they saw an 18% improvement in performance. They went 18% longer in a time trial to exhaustion before they quit. One little note, uh, motivational self-talk versus instructional self-talk. Motivational self-talk works really well for endurance performance. For baseball, for golf, for things like that, not as well. For something like that, you might be giving yourself instructional self-talk. Keep that elbow in, keep your head down, keep your eyes focused. So there's a little difference in how we can do it depending on the sport. I'm going to focus on the endurance side because that's my interest. So, but a lot of this mental training does correlate and does work for other sports as well. But as I was reading through these, I ended up, I kept coming to the same question. How is this working? How is motivational self-talk working? How is goal setting improving performance? There were no mechanisms. They just said, hey, look, we see an improvement. But they never got into the how. The only study that tried to address it was this motivational self-talk uh, study. And the only thing they said is motivational self-talk made exercise feel easier. It, made, it reduced that perception of effort. It's like, okay, how? What's changing in the body to allow this performance or this perception to actually feel easier? And they didn't answer that part. So how can I decipher the how? And I've got a couple of studies for that, but I'll, I'll walk through these two. The first study, I had students, non-athlete students come into my lab. I made them come into the lab six times. That may have been a mistake, as I'll show you in a moment. Six may have been a few too many. And they had to come in, and the first day, they, just, they did something called a VO2 test. So VO2 is, called, is a test that measures the volume of oxygen that we use. It takes about 15 minutes, but intensity just keeps getting up into, on the cycle or on the bike until they no longer can pedal, and they stop. From that, I actually determined their intensity for the next test. So then they came in five more times. And on each of those visits, they did a time trial to exhaustion. So I set a intensity that was pretty high. It was not fun. It hurts. They, most of the, um, part, my participants lasted between three and about eight minutes before they had to quit. That's a pretty high intensity. It's going to hurt. The first of those time trial to exhaustions was just a practice because they had no idea what they were doing. They had never done it, so I gave them practice. Then they came in and did four more. And after the first one, after that, uh, the first real time trial to exhaustion, I either had uh, subjects in a control group or a mental training group. The mental training group got four videos. They watched one video every night between trials. So they ended up watching videos like 15 times. Each video was about 15 minutes long and I just had them come in each time and I looked at what is their time trial to exhaustion. So what happened? The group that got the time trial, or got the videos, got the mental training videos, they did better. They improved on the time trial to exhaustion. You'll notice that my control group isn't at the finish line yet. They got worse. The key takeaway is that there was a 10% improvement in performance. Let's dig a little closer. I have to show graphs. I'm a, I'm a physiologist, I like graphs. So let's look at graphs. This left graph right here, it looks messy. Bear with me. This is my mental training group. Here is their baseline, their, pre, their first real test. Here's uh, after one week of mental training, after two weeks of mental training, after three weeks of mental training. There was a 10% improvement. 
All of those gray lines that you see, that's individual data. So I'm showing you what happens with each individual person. So there's a couple of people that didn't respond. Maybe they just had a really good day on day one and they didn't do as well after. But if we look at this, 12 of my 15 participants improved. That's pretty big. One person improved about 30%. That's a little, maybe an outlier, but hey, that's what the data showed. So some people do respond better than others. If we look at the other side, this is my control group. For the first two weeks, they had no change of performance. When they came in in week three, they had about a 10% decrement or decrease in performance. I have a feeling that these people didn't like me by week six. <laughs> A time trial to exhaustion hurts. By the end, you're suffering. And these people probably didn't want to come in anymore. They knew what was coming. Their motivation, their initial level of motivation before coming into the lab was reduced. They just didn't want to be there. They knew that if they quit earlier, they would get off the bike sooner. So they did stop sooner. So that might be why they actually finished sooner. So the question then is, why did we see the improvement? I can't just say, hey, there was a 10% improvement. Everybody else has done that, so what happened? Well, I did find some physiological changes. The first thing we can look at is this thing called VO2. How much oxygen were they using? So this was a fixed resistance, so it should, it should go up at the same amount over time. And yet, at the end, right here, there was a decrease in how much oxygen they were using. So my mental training group had a decrease in how much oxygen they were using. Why? Maybe they were, were recruiting their muscles more efficiently. I'm going to come back to this in a couple of slides. But recruiting muscles more efficiently, which means they didn't need as much oxygen. What else happened? Well, I saw decreases in breathing. My mental training group was breathing less. My group was actually breathing a little bit more, but my mental training group, they reduced their ventilation doing the same thing. This actually suggests that my mental training intervention worked. One of the things that we suggested for mental training was to modify your breathing. Slow down your breathing, take deeper breaths, which if we look at this next slide right here, they decreased how much they were breathing. They decreased their frequency of breathing. They were taking deeper breaths. Why does that matter? By slowing down our breathing, we activate our parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest system. We're telling our fight or flight system to slow down. So we calm our brain. We calm our body. We're better able to think. When we activate our parasympathetic system during competition, we actually allow our prefrontal cortex to make better decisions. So rather than have an emotional response of, man, this exercise test is not fun, I'm just done, we can actually use our prefrontal cortex going, I can do this. I can push for another couple of seconds. I can keep going. And we decrease our emotions, we reduce our anxiety, and we see an increase in performance. Interestingly, there was not a reduction in heart rate with this, I'm not showing that one, but heart rate didn't change. So that parasympathetic change didn't show up in the actual heart rate, unfortunately. So why is this happening? I have one more graph for you, and this is the big one. That big scary word, e electromyography, EMG, was reduced. There was about a 10% reduction in the signal from the brain to the muscles following mental training. There's something about mental training that seems to modify the electrical signal from the brain to the muscle. Why does that matter? That's kind of the question still. A couple things that I came up with, it's allowing our brain to better select the proper motor behavior so it makes our muscles more efficient. I don't need to recruit as many errant fibers or fibers that aren't associated with cycling so I use less oxygen. I'm using less brain energy, and I can save that for later on in the trial. It may decrease something called muscle synchronization. 
Think of what, when you watch the Olympics and you see people rowing crew. They're all pulling in unison and their boat flies forward and then stops. In the muscle, that would be a bad thing. We don't want our muscle to be all jerky. We want our muscle to kind of fire not in synchronization but asynchronously so it's a smooth forward motion the entire time throughout the contraction. And by increasing the efficiency of muscle, we actually delay recruiting those type two fast twitch fibers, those fibers that get tired very fast. If I can tell those fibers to wait and come in more near the end of exercise, I can actually go just a little bit longer as well. And I can then spare that glycogen until later on. So glycogen, imagine glycogen as the fuel for exercise. It's the gasoline that runs your car, the car being your muscles. If I can spare glycogen, it'd be like driving a Prius instead of a truck, and I don't need to use gas as much. It's there for later on in the performance, which allows me to keep pushing towards the end. Two things, though, that are really interesting here. I actually measured the level of fatigue in these individuals at the end. That did not change. So that 35% decrease in performance at the end, I saw that with these subjects as well. They were identical pre and post. So they still reached the same level of fatigue. It just took them longer to get there. So that rating of perceived exertion didn't change. It maybe just took them a little longer to get to the maximum amount or they were with able to withstand a greater percentage of effort. There was no change in how hard it felt. This is surprising to me. That perception of effort did not change. That previous study on cycling that had the 18% improvement, they said exercise felt easier. This study didn't show that. Why the difference? Great question. I don't have an answer to that. I just didn't see it. So, not sure why in that. So there's still a lot of questions as we try to figure out and tease apart why these performance changes happen. So what does study number one tell me? First, maximal exercise takes effort. When you push to maximum, it's not going to be easy. It takes effort. You need to be motivated to dig to, into that well dig into that pain cave of discomfort. It's never fun. If you don't have any motivation, you're not going to be willing to do it. So that control group that didn't have the motivation, they didn't want to go there anymore. They didn't want to push into that. But mental training seemed to allow my, at least training group, my mental training group, to keep that motivation moving forward. Second thing that I saw, mental training is not magic. That there actually are some physiologic changes that are occurring. I saw a reduced EMG, electromyography. I'm seeing a reduced respiratory rate, reduced ventilation, suggesting that we're activating that parasympathetic system, reducing our sympathetic. We're staying calmer so our brain can stay in charge. And we're reducing VO2. We're reducing the VO2 at the end of exercise, decreasing the slope so we can push just a little bit longer. So that's study number one. Study number two is a little bit different. So the first study used this thing called a time trial to exhaustion. How often do we do that? That's not anything that we would do in normal life. We don't just get on our bike and go at a fixed intensity. We don't go out on the road and just run at a fixed speed. It doesn't make sense. It's not something we would do in real life. So study number two, I had to change it up a little bit. I wanted to pick an exercise with a known end point. When we're doing a time trial to exhaustion, we don't know when we're going to end. We just quit when we feel like we have to. So instead, I chose a time trial. For runners, they're used to doing this. It's called a race. There's a known end point. There's a finish line. Most often, you'll see things like a 5K. I chose a mile and a half time trial. I wanted something that was fairly intense and yet fairly short so I could actually measure it. But I was also thinking to myself, it's like, hmm, when I'm tired when I'm running, my brain sure is talking to me a whole lot more. I wonder if I fatigued my participants, if I could get their brain talking to them, giving them negative messaging, would it be easier 
to find out what's going on. So I thought, why don't I fatigue my participants before they do a time trial? So what I did is I decided I need to find some, one, I need good athletes. I need some good runners. So I had them come in. I, I'm re I recruited and I am still recruiting people because I still need a few more subjects. This is preliminary data. I needed about 10 more subjects, just throwing that out there, uh, to do this. But I have, them, I have them come in and run 90 minutes on a track. I was one of the participants. I, I was out on the track, it was like 75 minutes in, I'm feeling good. Right after 75 minutes rolled around, I was like, oh, there's the fatigue. My legs are tired now. And then after the 90 minutes, I have them run up to my lab and within about two, maybe three minutes, they're on my treadmill doing a mile and a half time trial. This is an all out effort. It's more complex. We're adding fatigue to the legs. Yes, there's an end point of fatigue, but there's also the intermediate components. Your legs just feel tired. And doing a time trial, I have the treadmill running when they hop on, but once they're on, they're, my subjects are in charge of the speed. They can immediately slow down. Or if they want, they can speed up. I'm comparing this all to an initial non-tired level. So they're starting at the same speed as when they weren't tired. Most subjects are slowing down just a little bit right when they get on because their legs are tired. And not only are they physically tired, they're mentally tired. Running for 90 minutes wears you out. It takes mental effort to keep pushing. So adding in this slightly more complex study is hopefully yielding some interesting things, and I'll show you some preliminary results. One thing before I go on, they actually did this twice. So I made people run on the track for 90 minutes two times and do a time trial two times, separated by two weeks. During these two weeks, they got mental training videos again. And I'll talk more about these videos at the end, but they have two weeks of mental training videos. This time they were five minutes. So five minute videos, watching them one per night for two weeks. So the first thing I did is I looked at their 90 minute run data. Why did I have them run on the track? Not because it's boring, but because it's easy for me to measure. I can measure how far they've run. I can measure how fast they're running. I see them every 400 meters so I can look at heart rate and other things. And the first thing I found is they basically ran the same distance. It looks like these lines are a long ways apart. Here, this group ran 150 meters more over 90 minutes. This group ran 250 to 300 meters less over 90 minutes. They ran 16,000 meters. So that's a difference of one and a half percent. I'm okay with that. So I can call this that they ran the same distance. Remember, the tracks are outside. So we have things like weather. Yes, Santa Barbara has the same weather almost every day, but some of these were done during the summer. Most of this was done during the summer, and some of these days got hot. So that may have slowed people down. So I have to take that into account. So the weather varies, and yet they're within 400 meters, or one lap, over the course of 90 minutes. That's pretty nice. What's interesting, though, is the group that got mental training, that line in blue, their heart rate was eight beats per minute lower, even though they were running the same pace. Is mental training doing something here? Maybe. We can also look at how hard they felt like it, they were working. They had a half 0.5% decrease to one level decrease on that six to 20 scale. My control group, they felt like they were working harder. Okay, so maybe something's happening. But what about when they came into the lab? Did it work for the 90 minute run walk? Or not the 90 minute run walk, the mile and a half time trial. Why, yes it did. A mile and a half for my subjects is taking an average of between eight minutes. I think the average is like nine and a half minutes. That's not very long. That's six minute pace. I have some pretty good runners here. After mental training, my mental training group ran 37 seconds faster. That's over a mile and a half. That is huge. That's six and a half percent. Yes, my control group improved as well. They improved seven seconds, but that's 30 seconds faster if we get rid of the control group. There is some learning and things like that that happen. 
but 37 seconds versus seven seconds. Yes, mental training is working. Again, the question comes down to why? Again, preliminary data. I haven't corrected for things like speed because if you're running 37 seconds faster, that means you're running faster on the treadmill as well. And if you run faster, it's going to play a little bit of havoc with all of my metabolic variables. So the first thing I looked at is VO2. And for my mental training group, VO2 or the amount of oxygen that they were consuming was higher. It should be. They're running faster. The faster you go, the more oxygen you use to maintain that speed. So I would expect this to be higher. I would expect them to use more. For the most part, my control group stayed about the same until the end. They used a little bit more as well. So exactly what I was expecting. I probably need to correct for speed to see if there's anything happening here. What about heart rate? If they're running faster, if their VO2 is higher, I would expect heart rate to be faster, yes? Hopefully, if you run faster, your heart rate should be higher. If you've ever run outside, you know this. Well, that's not what I saw. Heart rate was actually lower until the end. So heart rate was about two beats lower for the first half, one beat lower for the middle, and then at the end when they were pushing really hard, it got higher. This tells me that individuals, again, were maybe calmer. Perhaps they were changing their breathing pattern to activate their parasympathetic system. So again, they can make better choices. There's something happening here where they're just staying calmer and they're able to push more. Maybe they're decreasing how hard they feel like they're working or their stress of getting on the treadmill. Because I tell you, when you finish that 90 minute run and you're looking at that treadmill running underneath you and you're about to hop on, that's a stressful situation as you try to stay on that treadmill. Breathing was modified too, except this time ventilation was increased. Again, they're running faster. Ventilation, breathing should be higher. And that's what we saw. But it was done by increasing their size of breath. The respiratory rate was actually a little bit lower. I'm not showing that one. But they were taking bigger, deeper breaths activating that parasympathetic system, calming down their sympathetic system. So again, we're seeing this mental training directly working in the data. And the most interesting thing is they're running faster. It should feel harder, right? No, it actually felt easier. It felt between one and two levels easier on my scale. For my participants, it felt easier all the way to the end, even when they were sprinting at the end during that last 0.2 miles, that last minute, it still felt easier than it did before. Why did it feel easier? Great question. There's, they're doing something that modifies their brain. There's something about how we're sensing this, whether it's the signal down that's modifying how hard this feels. There's something about mental training that makes exercise feel easier. It didn't show up in my first study, it's showing up here. Gotta love research when you, things are different every single time you do it. So still trying to figure this part out. So why is it happening? Great question. So what are some key takeaways? First, my key takeaway as I'm looking at this data, time trials are way harder to analyze. People can change the speed. They're not running at the exact same intensity every single time. So they were running on, I think on average, 0.3 to 0.5 miles an hour faster during this trial. So my subjects, my mental training subjects were running significantly faster and I'm going to need to correct for that. But this applies more to a real world scenario. This is more like what we're used to doing so this will be more applicable to more people. My second key takeaway, mental training is still working. Yes, VO2 is modified, it's higher. We're seeing changes in breathing. Our RPE and our heart rate were lower. So there's something here and we're trying to figure out the how still. Once I get my next 10 subjects through, 
I'll actually hopefully have a better idea of why. I just need a few more to have the power I need. So I'm not recruiting at all. <laughs> I never actually stop recruiting. So what are some practical takeaways? How can I or how can you increase your mental performance? In other words, what was the magic in those videos that gave you those physiological takeaways, those physiologic realities? So the first one, deal with your stress. So during exercise, you need to deal with your stress. And before I even go any further, let me reframe this. I'm not a sports psychologist. I am an exercise physiologist. I'm actually partnering with a sports psychologist, um, Stephen Gonzalez, who is a professor. Uh, he's in the peak performance lab at Dartmouth College. He is what's called a certified mental performance consultant. Technically not a sports psychologist because they don't do psychology. They don't do one-on-one -on -one psychology sessions, that type of thing. He is a certified mental performance consultant. I got the videos from him. I realized I couldn't do sports psychology things. So I had to reach out to somebody I, that could. I went to grad school with him. He gave me these tips. So I'm taking these from him. These are in the videos that I used. So takeaway number one, deal with your stress. Part of what we need to do is realize that stress is good. If I don't have stress, I'm never going to grow. When we lift weights, when we run, we physically stress our body. If I do that over and over, I'm going to get better. If I lift weights, my muscles will get bigger, I can lift more weight. The same thing happens when we mentally stress our body. If we mentally stress ourselves over and over, eventually we'll be able to deal with more stress or handle it better. So we need to go and actually deal with our stress. What's one way to deal with our stress? Breathe. Take deep breaths. Before I came up here, I had to make sure I calmed myself. I actually used this one. I took a few deep, slow breaths to calm myself, to activate that parasympathetic system. One thing that he said is when we take that deep breath in, when you take a deep breath in, we're inhaling good, we're inhaling positive, we're inhaling energy. And even during exercise or during a speech, you can do this. You can remember, it's like, inhale the good, inhale the positive, inhale the energy. And when you breathe out, you take that long, slow breath out, you're exhaling the bad, the negativity, the stress, the fatigue of exercise. And you can kind of remember to inhale the good, exhale the bad. And that can help you increase your performance. It helps you be in the moment, which sometimes can be really hard to do when things are hurting. So being in that moment can allow you to improve your performance. It also allows you within work, within life, to be in the moment. When you're in a stressful situation, maybe with kids, be in the moment. The second thing within this kind of same vein is separate fact from story. We're always dealing with different things that are happening. So examine the fact. So if I'm exercising, I can tell myself, this hurts. That's okay to say. That is a fact. My legs hurt. I'm breathing a lot. Those are facts. But what sometimes happens in our brain is we start telling ourselves a story with the fact. So maybe my legs hurt and I start telling myself, oh, you must be out of shape. You can't do this anymore. And you start giving yourself these negative stories that maybe aren't true. So we need to be able to separate the fact from the story and prevent ourselves from elaborating on that fact, which can help us reduce our stress as well. We can look at the fact, we can stay in the moment and actually keep moving forward. The second video that we had for our subjects dealt with self-talk. Self-talk is any statement or thought about ourselves, whether good or bad. We're constantly talking to ourselves. Even right now, you're talking to yourself. You're probably telling, saying that I'm, what's he talking about? He doesn't even know what he's doing. Or maybe that's my self-talk about what I think you're saying. <laughs> Sometimes I get confused. One thing to realize with this is that positive or negative self-talk is not necessarily bad. Let me say that part again. Either positive or negative self-talk, 
is not necessarily bad. The key is that it has to be effective. Some people thrive off of positive self-talk saying, you can do this, you're doing great, keep it up, you can, you've got this. Some people thrive off of negative self-talk. You suck, you can't do this anymore. And then you try to prove yourself wrong. The key is that you need to find self-talk that works for you. Not everybody will be the same. We all know people that thrive off of just praising themselves, saying they're great. Other people like to put themselves down and that makes them do better. So figure out what works for you. And part of what we can do for that is look at something called R3 or P3 thinking. So when we're thinking about an event, so maybe I'm out running, I'm in a race and I trip. That's my event. What's next is I have thoughts that happen and then I have an action in response to that event. R3 thinking would be um, random, reactive, or restrictive. Maybe I start to panic and I restrict like, oh, you're done now, you can't do it anymore. That's not helpful. Instead, I need P3 thinking, purposeful, productive, and I give myself the chance of possibility. So it's like, oh, I tripped, okay. Let's recover, breathe for a second, push, get back to where we need to be, you got this. And you think about your thinking, it's like trying to avoid these default mechanisms of random, reactive, and restrictive, and try to find these P3 thoughts that are purposeful, productive, and give yourself a chance of possibility. One of my subjects, I actually had to do a short paper on this for credit for something. And he was writing this like, throughout this time trial, I kept thinking about what food I was gonna eat after. I was thinking, should I go get a blender? It's like, that's very random thinking. He didn't have a great performance. It wasn't purposeful, it wasn't productive thinking that helped him do better. Next thing is control what you can control. There's a lot of things that are, out of, out, that are out of our control. We can't control much of life, unfortunately. But what we need to do is think about what I have. What can I control? I need to approach these thoughts differently. If it's out of my control, I need to approach it differently than if it's in my control. If it's in my control, I need to give it attention. If I give attention to things I can't control, it reduces my chances for success. So things like, this is where I think of like baseball or tennis, these sports that actually have more things out of our control. If the umpire calls you out but you were actually safe or calls a strike when it was actually a ball, how do you react to that? Do you get all mad at the umpire? Or do you have thoughts of how do I focus and move forward from here? If you're an endurance athlete and you're in a race, it's like, oh, I can't control, my, I can't control the weather. I can't control that it's 95 degrees today but I can control my response to it. I can go, it's like, it's 95. I'm not going to run as fast, that's okay. I'm going to give it my best effort for what I can do today. So how do you control the things that you can control? How do you let go the things that you don't? So you can kind of draw a circle. The things in the circle are things you can, tr you can control. That's where you wanna focus your time and your effort and your mind. The things outside of the circle are things you can't control. Those are things you want to let go, things that you maybe want to ignore, or you look at, and it's like, okay, it happened. Let's bring it back, control my, my thoughts, my actions. So how do you do that? You can use this acronym called PACER, and I love that Dr. Gonzalez thought of this. It's a really great acronym to me. This can actually help you set the pace or tone for competition. So PACER stands for, the P stands for preparation. You can control how you prepare for an event. You can control the amount of sleep you get the night before. You can control what you eat. You can control your equipment. You can control your reaction towards the temperature. Those are things you can control. You can control how you prepare. The A stands for attitude. You can control your attitude towards a competition. You can, can control your attitude towards giving a speech. Are you going to show up and do what, do the best you can, have a positive attitude, not be all negative about it? You can have, you can, you can control the attitude around what you're doing. 
Sorry. The C stands for concentration. You can control your level of concentration. Are you going to allow your mind to wander? Are you going to be thinking about dinner later on? Or are you going to be in the present moment? Are you going to be focused and concentrated on the event in front of you? The E stands for effort. Are you going to give 100% on that day? Maybe on a given day, you only have 80% of your ability there. Maybe you're dealing with a little sickness or you're dealing with a minor injury. You have 80% of what you can possibly do, but are you going to give it 100% of the effort and try to get to that 80% level? Or are you gonna be happy just getting to 75 of your 80%? Are you going to give it your full effort? And then finally, the R stands for response. How are you going to respond when things don't go your way? How are you going to respond when the umpire calls a strike when it should be a ball? How are you going to respond when your competitor just sprints out in front of you? How are you going to respond when you trip and fall? Response deals, response is the key component here. Are you going to use some strategies to help you respond? Are you going to use your self-talk to help buoy you back to where you need to be? Are you going to find a way, a mantra, to help you get back on track when things fall apart? How are you going to get back to where you should be? And by using this pacer thinking, the preparation, attitude, concentration, effort, and response, it allows you to stay focused on what you can control. And by being focused on what you can control, it can give you confidence. So think about when you're driving in a car and you're in the passenger seat and you're not in control. And there's a lot of traffic. How do you respond when there's a couple of close calls? Do you have confidence? Probably not. You feel more confident when you're in control, when you're behind the wheel. By using this type of thinking, it puts you behind the wheel again, which gives you that confidence to keep moving forward. So it just helps you stay focused and allows you to stay focused on what you can control so you can get your best performance. So those are the three practical takeaways spread out over a little lo bit longer. So I wanna thank you, thank Westmont College with us. They helped me do these studies. You can see my lovely lab on the left and on the right. So I spent a lot of time around that track watching people run for 90 minutes at a time before coming back into the lab. I want to thank my collaborator, Stephen Gonzalez, uh, Dr. Gonzalez at Dartmouth College. I want to thank my undergrad research assistants. They did a ton of work on this. There's times I left them out on the track for a few minutes so I could go get a couple other things done, and they recorded a lot of data down at that track. So I want to thank Damien, I want to thank Carly, Gavin, Michael, Emma, and Sten. They did a ton of work on these two projects. And I want to thank all of my participants. I couldn't do this without them, and they spent a lot of time as well. So I want to thank them. Then I want to open it up for questions. If you have any questions, please let me know. So one thing I was thinking about is it's hard to actually doing, say, guided breathing. I haven't yet. So during the actual trials, I'm trying to say as little as possible because I want the subject to be just focused on themselves. I want them to be using those strategies only I'm trying to get rid of any external thoughts, external motivation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I sometimes forget to remind them, but it's, I sometimes when I remember, it's like, Remember those videos you've been watching. Use those techniques during this trial. And I just try to give them that simple cue just before they start. I'm trying to keep the time between the track and the running as consistent as possible so that initial heart rate is as close to possible. But yeah, that's a great, yeah. Yeah, and I am definitely trying to do that. I'm trying to remind people at least to use those cues as much as possible.
Okay. Have I looked at the data between speed? Yeah. I'm repeating it for the camera as well because this is being recorded. Mm -hmm. I ha yeah. I haven't yet because I don't have enough people. So there's only 10 people, so it's really hard to separate it. Um, and I actually haven't looked at all the individual data yet either. But overall, everybody has improved. It has either stayed the exact same or improved. Uh, the control group, everybody's improved except for a couple. And the improvements are just much, much smaller. The improvements in the control group are all about 1%. The improvements in the mental training group are all about 4 or 5% for everybody. So we're seeing about the same improvement across the board, including in some of the faster individuals. Yeah. Um, there seemed to be a lot of emphasis on the sh keeping, shifting back to the parasympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. for performance. And then I remember on Doak's uh, governor theory chart, mm -hmm. the emotional, like somebody getting really angry, yeah. you know, as far as their performance goes. So, mm -hmm. you know, they can say, well, that really works for me, but, you know, would that give them the distance? Yeah. So how does emotion actually play a role and emotion? Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually one of the weird things. So there have been studies that have looked at what does anger do for performance? And this was looking more at a strength performance. And people actually did perform just as well being angry as relaxed and focused. With endurance, I haven't seen this study. Although I've seen on message boards where some people run really fast while angry as well. So I haven't gotten into that point yet. But some people do run well off that negative self-talk where they do get really angry. They're yelling at themselves and that can improve performance. I'd be really, yeah. I'd be really intrigued to see what's happening to their heart rate and everything else. So I don't have an answer. But at least in ours, we're seeing this reduced heart rate, change in breathing, that seems to allow them to go a little longer. Great question, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Four videos. Uh, they watched the first of the series only in the lab, so. They watched that one three times. They watched the other three videos twice in the intervening week. So they watched each one twice for each week, so they saw them six times. In the second study, um, there was three videos. They watched one per night, and then what went in order. So night one, they watched video one. Night two, they watched video two. Night three, they watched video three. Then they repeated it. So they showed oh, four times, maybe five times, just really trying to get the message to sink in. Because I know when I watched the video, I had to take notes and pause. Because there were so many interesting facts there. I had to actually slow down. Reflection actually helped me to unlock what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these videos are, not, are actually not available right now. Um, because they're kind of my buddy's property, I'm only using them for people in the study. So they're actually on YouTube, but they're not searchable. So you can't find them. You need the actual link to find them. Still won't come up. That's actually a great question. Why did I choose to use good athletes? I was trying to reduce variability. I wanted less variability in the time trial. And individuals who know how to race are going to be more consistent. And the other thing too is they had to run 90 minutes. And 90 minutes is a long time. So they ran on average 16 kilometers, which is about 10 miles for the average group. Some people ran just over 20 kilometers. So there's a little bit of variability there, but for most people, running for 90 minutes is going to hurt a lot, and I don't want them to hurt. I want it to be hard and tiring, but not painful. Yeah. 
Yeah, so how much does a coach actually matter? I want to say a lot. It's not just the physical, it's the keen in on your emotional state. Coaches can actually see what's going on with your body and they can help remind you. And every single athlete there basically has a psychological coach as well. Um, so I was watching the Winter Olympics about six years ago and I was watching the aerialists. After this guy finished his jump, he sat down and I saw a female coach sit next to him. I was like, I recognize her. It was one of the professors from Utah talking to his mental, certified mental performance consultant, figuring out what he could do, preparing going back and doing it again. So coaching matters. They can help key you in on those little things that might really help your performance. So yeah, I think it really does matter. Do I have a coach? No, but should I? Yes. So what's making it feel easier? Is there something in the blood? So I've thought about doing lactate testing, which is just a finger prick. Um, that may actually be coming down a little bit if there's less brain activity. I need to add that in for probably the next study that I do. Endorphins, things like that, that's really hard. And endorphins are dealing more in the brain. Um, so it's like endorphins and something called endocannabinoids together that give you that pleasurable sensation. That's really hard to get at. I, don't, I, I have no clue how to do that because I don't know how to get in, inside the brain to measure those. So that's a little bit harder. And you can't do mental training on a mouse where I could actually go and look at their brains. How do you motivate a mouse? <laughs> Other than food, yeah, some cheese. So did I measure their heart rate at rest? I unfortunately did not. I wish I had. Um, for the first study, they did a five minute warm up, and then there was a variable amount of time before they actually started. I wish I had that more precise so I could see how much their heart rate came down before they actually started the real trial. That's one of those things in hindsight, I wish I had controlled. But having undergrads for my helping run it, things happen as well. So, my equipment might not work or something else happens. There's sometimes just things that happen, so it's really hard to have accurate measures with all of it. Yeah, it's things out of my control. And it's those things that can say, oh, I wish I had done that. Yeah. And that's a great question, though. Yeah. yeah, do I do I actually use this in my students? A little bit. I usually recommend that they do take a couple of deep breaths. That's the easiest one to use. I've, as I work with a couple of students that <clears throat> just failed my first exam, yes, I'm going to be talking to them and trying to help them deal with their anxiety and their stress. I had a student come into my office the other day, it's like, okay, you're anxious, what are some things we can do? So I'll sometimes do it more in one-on-one -on -one conversations. I don't usually do it as a whole, but I always just start with a simple. Just take a couple of slow, deep breaths. Feel that anxiety leaving you. Feel that calmness. Clear your brain and be ready to go. Do I need to do it more? Probably. Yeah. 
I mean, we all need these strategies for different performances because exercise performance is no different from work performance or from performing with kids. There's strategies we need to remember and use when we're dealing with hard things. These strategies work the same for all activities. So they can be helpful. It's just changing the words around them a little bit. So I can prepare to deal with my kids when they're tired and angry or hungry. So I can do some preparation mentally before I get there. So is my main goal to see how far the brain can push the body? Kind of. It's more I really want to understand how the brain is affecting the body, because I know it works. But I, I'm just really curious, like everybody says like, do mental training. Why? I'm just really curious about the mechanism to understand why it works. And I, yes, I want to get the most out of myself that I can. Have I thought about doing the ice plunges? No. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, like looking at an ice plunge and seeing if it would work with that. So I haven't thought about actually doing research with that. I have no desire to do that on my own. I hate cold water. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do it with my physiology class, though. So I do that as a way to look at an intervention to see how they can improve their performance. And I see a variety of students. Some students will, be able, will only put their arm in. So I'm only doing single arm. So I can. Some people will do 30 seconds. Some people could put their arm in and just keep it there for 15 minutes. I don't know why some people go longer than others. I don't know what's going on. Could be interesting to do down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My only concern was that there would be more adaptation to just being used to cold. Because it's a pretty quick adaptation. It's over four weeks with students. It, I wouldn't expect to see much change from five minutes of cycling in terms of physical. I would expect to see more adaptation there because there's a lot of things within the skin that will actually modify performance. You just learn how to interpret it differently, and it, that adaptation happens much faster. So there might be a little bit more going on that might be hard to tease apart. You still might, yeah. Was there a pre or post exercise routine mentally that your subject did not available for the low low class? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't I didn't give them a prescribed one. What? I didn't give them a prescribed pre or post exercise routine. They may have done their own just naturally and they reflect on the information. Yeah. Any of my subjects see a difference in other things in their life? Or do you forget your stuff? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't track anything outside of that. I do have a survey that looks at grit and resilience. I didn't report on that. I didn't see changes in that. That scale's not very sensitive. So I don't know if, it, if they saw changes outside of exercise. I was, I'm mainly focused on the exercise performance at this point. So I don't know if they saw changes elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, visualization definitely plays a role within this too. Um, 
in the first study I did, one of the videos was focused on visualization. It's the kind of preparing yourself for what's going to come. So it's preparing yourself for understanding this discomfort that's about to hit or seeing yourself succeeding. It's just kind of trying to get your body prepared. So it's dealing with that preparation component so you're ready to handle what's coming and so you can better control the things you can control. Yeah, 10% was statistically significant. I don't remember the R value, um, but it was pretty high. For my running study, not yet. So with 10 subjects in each group, I don't have the sample size. I was planning on 15 subjects. That will definitely give it to me. I'm within already, I'm at 0.06 right now. So I'm almost statistically significant. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's, the first one was definitely statistically significant. Yeah, so for the running study, they're all from this. So each bullet point was one of the three videos. So the first video dealt with dealing with your stress, separating fact from story. The second video dealt completely with self-talk. The third video dealt with controlling what you can control. And they were only five minutes. They were jam-packed. Um, I was actually making notes, and I had seven pages of notes on my iPad when I finished watching the three videos. So 15 minutes, I had a lot of notes. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>